Everyone, my name is Maria. I am the campaign coordinator for the Keep LA House Coalition, um, the coalition of tenants, tenant right advocates, public interest lawyers, um, and community-based organizations, working together to ensure that all renters across LA County have the right to affordable, secure, and habitable housing, free from harassment and discrimination, with our main focus being a tenant bill of rights. We are so excited to be here today, getting us started on the very important conversation of healthy homes and housing conditions in uh, the county and city of LA. And of course, our tenant bill of rights includes a strong and robust code enforcement. Some of the great member organizations involved with making this forum uh, happen are SAGE, CPC, LAFLA, and many, many more. Um, if you know of any org that you'd like to give a shout out, please do so in the chat box. In today's town hall discussion, we hope to achieve these uh, objectives, which are to popularize the R acronym of RHHP, which is um, our code enforcement um, campaign, right? That we're uh, shortening to H to RHHP. We want to demystify code enforcement. Um, we want to dig uh, a little deeper in understanding of our recommendations for the Rental Housing Habitability Program, which again, in short, is RHHP. And we also want to gain understanding of the impact of stronger code enforcement. Um, these are the objectives we came up with. And of course, um, we hope that other objectives are also fulfilled in this teaching. So we also have a comprehensive agenda today that hopefully will help us achieve these goals we've laid out. Um, to, to begin, we will talk about the road to code enforcement reform, following with how does code enforcement work in the county and uh, the rental housing habitability program, uh, overview recommendations of those, of that program and a tenant power tenant power panel. And finally, a call to action. You all know um, that we always have calls to action. I'm gonna get us started um, and move us forward into a quick overview and history of our Tenant Bill of Rights campaign, um, specifically with code enforcement. The road to code enforcement reform. Um, this work has been occurring um, way before Keep LA House, right? I want to emphasize that Keep LA House was born in fall of 2021 with the goal of eliminating rent debt, evictions, and other harmful consequences of the rent debt occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic um, in the city and county of Los Angeles. So in December 2019, uh, SAGE members voted to make uh, reforming LA County's code enforcement a campaign priority. Later in 2021, recommendations to reform and improve the county's enforcement process were formulated and drafted. After this, or in the means, in the midst of this, Keep LA House is born. And in December 2021, conversations with um, Supervisor District 2 and Supervisor District 3 in the county um, were being held and the motion for uh, code enforcement was drafted. April 2022, just at the same time I'm being hired as the campaign coordinator um, to give us a best shot at the Tenant Bill of Rights, um, a motion for rental housing habitability work group and REAP program in Los Angeles County passes. Really big, right? April, 2022. Moving us into 2023, in March, we, had, we were notified that the ordinance draft was finished and with many hopes to accomplish something by the end of this year, right? Um, moving us along into spring and summer of 2023, 
there was virtual stakeholder meetings and feedback sessions held for tenants led by the Department of Public Health. Still in, in dire hopes and, and holding on to something being accomplished by the end of this year. And um, it, it wasn't until December, right? Just this last week that we have gotten the news that the ordinance vote is, is postponed. So what do we do um, moving forward and how does code enforcement currently work in the county is probably some of the questions. Next slide. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to um, my comrade in the fight, Chelsea. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, you know, why it's really urgent that this ordinance is passed and adopted. And I'm going to talk about the county's role in keeping our homes safe and habitable and how unfortunately the county has fallen short of its responsibilities in this regard. As most of us present here today are aware, the issue of substandard housing is widespread across unincorporated LA County, especially in our lowest income communities. And the, current, the county's current approach to code enforcement is not working. So what is a habitable, healthy, and safe home? So according to the law, specifically under California Civil Code 1941.1, a home must meet several criteria to be considered habitable. This includes having waterproof roofs and walls that don't have holes in them, having well-maintained plumbing, gas, heating, and electrical systems, having a safe and sanitary home free of pests and vermin. And because this is the law, uh, property owners must keep homes to these standards, yet we know they don't. And it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that they do. So despite existing efforts at the county, uh, we've identified significant shortfalls in code compliance for instance, um, out of over 10,000 code violations across 4,800 properties between 2016 and 2021, a staggering 90% remained unresolved after um, a year after the initial inspection. And so this indicates the need for a more effective enforcement strategy. Tenants who report violations shouldn't be dealing with these issues for over a year after they've reported them. Moreover, we also see a disproportionate impact of these violations in communities with lower incomes, uh, like Athens, Westmont, East LA, Florence, Firestone, and Lenox, uh, which raises concerns about equitable living conditions. And so this is a, vis a visualization of the concentration of code violations in the county uh, between 2016 and 2021. And it puts into perspective where code violations are concentrated so, for example, on the far left, um, on the on the coast, you'll see the county of Marina del Rey. In Marina del Rey, um, less than one percent of code enforcement cases during this period occurred, and it's a higher income area with an average median income of over a hundred thousand dollars. Now, contrast that with Athens Westmont, uh, and you have a different story. Um, 21% of code violation cases occurred in Athens, Westmont, and the area median income is significantly lower than Marina del Rey. Uh, it's $38,000 a year. And so that's a stark difference that really highlights the disparity in living conditions across the county. You have lower income areas reporting more violations and more uninhabitable housing. So take the example of Lourdes Viegas. Uh, this is a SAGE member and a resident of East Rancho Dominguez. Her experience with code enforcement really demonstrates the failures of our current system. Lourdes has spent her entire life, 42 years in this apartment. It's uh, more than just a structure for her. It's a home where she grew up with her siblings and where she continues to live with her two children, ages 10 and 14. Her daughter is also battling cancer right now. And so for Lourdes, um, the fight for habitable living conditions is not just about comfort, but about providing a healthy environment for her family. And so these are photos that we're just going to take a look. I'm just going to warn you, these photos are intense. Um, and these are photos of her home to see the conditions Lourdes is living in. Um, these are broken windows that don't work. They don't open and close correctly. Pests from outside enter into the home through the broken windows. 
um, throughout Lourdes' home. She has holes um, in the restrooms, in the kitchen, where rodents and pests enter. Um, and she's asked her landlord to repair them, and, and he hasn't, and it's continued to deteriorate over time. She's also dealing with really bad infestations, cockroaches. Um, she hasn't had hot water since 2018. So for over five years, Lourdes has had no hot water. And this is her water heater. It has been red tagged by the by the gas company for being unsafe. Um, just more photos of, of holes. She also doesn't have adequate lighting throughout the apartment. And as you see on the left photo, um, one of the only electrical outlets that work in her home is in the kitchen. And so that's where the lamp is plugged in. Um, next slide. And these are more infestations, um, ants, and then regularly they see dangerous spiders. So Lourdes's home violates almost every provision of the habitability law that I defined earlier. And since November 2020, Lourdes has been working within the county's existing code enforcement system to try to get these issues resolved with no success. So what's happening here? Uh, why isn't Lourdes's issues getting resolved? So I want to take some time to walk through um, the timeline of events just to sort of demonstrate where there are shortcomings in our current system. So Lourdes, Lourdes problems date back to 2011 when a new owner took over the management of the property. His name is Ramon. Uh, cockroaches started to appear and Lourdes told the new landlord Ramon that he needed to do something about it. He didn't. He didn't respond to her. He ignored her. And after continued requests for many years, finally in 2013, he made one half-hearted attempt to deal with the cockroach oh. issue uh, with some store-bought spray. It didn't work, and he never tried to address the issue again. For the next seven years, seven years, Lourdes continued to call her landlord repeatedly to fix the issues. The, the apartment deteriorated continuously over time, by 2018, as I said, Lourdes uh, lost access to hot water. Her water heater was red tagged. Um, she had, you know, numerous issues. And despite persistent requests, the landlord remained unresponsive. And so at this time, Lourdes was not aware that she could report violations to the county through the Department of Public Health. Um, she was trying to just ask her landlord to fix the issues. And he didn't. In October of 2020, um, almost a decade after first reporting issues, uh, the landlord tried to illegally evict her uh, during an eviction moratorium during COVID. And this is how Lourdes found out about SAGE. And we were able to help her file complaints with the Department of Public Health, which is the agency in charge of code enforcement for rental housing. So this led to an inspection in November of 2020, which revealed numerous violations the landlord was issued a compliance order and a follow-up inspection was scheduled for the next month. The next month came, despite orders from the county, the landlord made no repairs and the landlord was not issued a fine for this either. There was no penalty. DPH did not inspect again until five months later in May and still no repairs had been made. Um, and still no penalty to the landlord. Um, another reinspection occurred the following month in June. Still, despite compliance orders to the landlord, no repairs were made. In July of the next year, in 2021, um, DPH came out again for another inspection, citing the same violations. At this point, um, Lourdes had lost faith in the agency to um, fix the issues or to get the landlord to fix the issues. No progress was being made. Conditions were getting worse. The agency even admitted that they had done all they could do. They referred the case to the district attorney. Uh, Lourdes went on to sue the landlord over the conditions. She also filed for and received a rent adjustment through a different county agency. Um, even then, Ramon, the landlord, still was not motivated to fix the issues. In the following two and a half years since July 2021, 
two and a half years. Between August 2021 and November 2023, there were 16 more inspections that occurred and no repairs were made. Last month, Ramon hired someone, finally, to paint over the mold on the walls. He did not hire a professional mold remediator. He hired a handyman to paint over the walls, and he also provided fire and carbon monoxide alarms. This is all he's done in the last three years since first getting the agency involved. And the district attorney, as far as we're all aware, has not pursued the case. This is just a visualization of all the inspections that have occurred at the property, 24 inspections. And still, Lourdes is living in the same conditions um, she had the first from the beginning. <clears throat> this is outrageous. So what's going on here? Why, why hasn't Ramon made repairs? Why has our current system failed to motivate compliance? Um, I think we need to look at the current inspection protocols to sort of look at where the gaps are. Um, so I just want to also share, you know, what the current structure is. So the Department of Public Health is sort of responsible for, um, you know, maintenance issues and public health issues in rental housing. And they conduct two kinds of inspections. They conduct complaint based inspections, which is initiated when a tenant files a complaint for an issue and then routine inspections, which are initiated by the agency on an annual basis. For complaint inspections, uh, tenants first file complaints online or by phone if they have an issue that their landlord won't repair. Uh, before COVID, the inspector would uh, go to the property within three to five days of a complaint. Um, during COVID, and I believe this is still the protocol, uh, landlords are issued a 21-day courtesy notice by mail to comply with the issues outlined in the, com outlined in the complaint. So three weeks go by, and if the landlord is non-compliant, um, the tenant needs to reach out to the agency to let them know that the landlord did not fix the issue. At that Arregló la situación o los problemas. En ese momento, el departamento hace una viene y hace una inspección. Document violations. If violations are found, an administrative fee is charged, but no fines. And an, a compliance order is issued um, with another compliance deadline of up to three weeks. When the compliance deadline is uh, over, another reinspection occurs. Um, and if the landlord is still non-compliant, uh, the department has just a few courses of action they can take. They can one, grant extensions to the landlord to give them more time to fix issues. Uh, this is very common. We see this a lot. Landlords are given time, more time and more time and more time to fix issues. Um, the second is that the department can conduct an office hearing um, where you know they ask the landlord what's going on. Uh, you need to make these repairs. You have this time, you know, and try to try to get a sense of why they aren't complying. And the third is that they send a referral to the district attorney. This is the highest form of escalation. Uh, it's very uncommon for the district attorney to take these kinds of cases, to take cases based on rental apartment repairs. And so without the ability to issue fines, um, there's not a huge financial incentive to motivate landlords to comply under this system. And so this is a problem, I think, is evidenced by Lourdes's case. Um, none of the current tools at the agency's disposals have been effective um, in this situation. So the second type of inspection is a routine inspection. Um, DPH does these inspections annually, and they target multifamily buildings with over four units. So inspectors will go to the property without any advance notice and inspect the units that they're given access to. This means that um, tenants need to let them into their homes. Because there's no advance notice, um, tenants are either not home or you know don't know who this person is, why they're here, and won't let them in. So According to conversations we've had with the department in the past, um, they estimate around 10% of properties get inspected each year. Um, that's a really low percentage. Um, 
So once, but once an inspection does occur, um, it does follow the same protocols as the complaint-based inspections that we just reviewed, where there are compliance deadlines, reinspections, and then limited courses of further action. So Lourdes' uh, story uplifts sort of key issues with our current code enforcement system. Uh, we're only gonna we we're only touching on a few of them today, um, but many of them stem from systemic inefficiencies and lack of strong penalties. With regard to the current approach to routine inspections, uh, tenant tenants often face the challenge of insufficient notice for these inspections, leading to missed opportunities to address violations. Um, this issue is compounded by, you know, extended resolution times once violations are discovered as, you know, as I said earlier, you know, landlords are frequently granted extensions, which results in prolonged periods between inspections. Enforcement overall is weakened by inadequate resolution strategies, the limited authority of the Department of Public Health to impose fines on landlords, and the uh, rarity of district attorney cases. Also want to uplift that um, communication breakdowns further exacerbate the issue. Um, tenants are often left in the dark regarding the status of their cases, and they do not have an easy way to track um, the status of their case. Additionally, lack of multilingual support restricts access for non-English speaking tenants, and the complexity of complaint filing processes adds another layer of difficulty. Um, as some folks don't have access to the internet or don't, you know, don't know how to file complaints. For the first seven years of dealing with these issues, Lourdes didn't know she could go to the Department of Public Health to file complaints. And so it's really important that routine inspections happen and reach all units. Um, and finally, you know, the tendency of landlords to perform superficial cost minimizing repairs rather than addressing significant maintenance needs really undermines health and safety codes. Um, as I said, also Lourdes experienced uh, Mickey Mouse repairs, which I think a lot of tenants experience. The landlord came and just painted over the black mold instead of actually remediating it. Painting over it doesn't get rid of it. I just wanna conclude this section um, just to really highlight the urgency of this issue. Um, by sharing a news story from earlier this year uh, in May in Davenport, Iowa, uh, as you see from the photo, a residential apartment building collapsed. Uh, records showed that the landlord had long ignored the property's needs. And despite city inspectors and engineers flagging the property is unsafe, recommending immediate action to correct it, these warnings went unheeded. Uh, three people died because the building collapsed. This catastrophe is a stark reminder of why we need to urgently adopt a stronger system. And we need to equip the Department of Public Health with the tools that they need to hold property owners accountable. Thank you. I will now pass it on to Cassidy. Thank you, Chelsea. All right, everybody. So as Maria mentioned at the start, uh, the Rental Housing Habitability Program, the RHHP, was proposed this year in LA County. It was presented and shared this year. They've been gathering feedback, and I'm going to share a little bit of the overview now. A, it's a lot of information, and I'm going to move through it fairly fast because I want to get us onto our tenant panel, but We'll have time for questions at the end after our tenant panel. So feel free to stay and ask then or uh, follow up with us if you have questions as well. So it was proposed in April, 2023. We've we've attended the meetings and shared some feedback on them. And, and as mentioned at the beginning, we're waiting on the final ordinance and full proposal to see what feedback has been incorporated. So as Chelsea was mentioning the old uh, program for code enforcement. This is the new proposal. Um, first is that routine inspections would actually take place once every four years and they would be noticed. A landlord would get 30 calendar days notice. And if they want to reschedule, they have to request that at least seven days in advance. And it still has to happen uh, within 30 days of that 
original inspection date. Some of the feedback that we provided is that we would also like tenants to be notified. As Chelsea mentioned, that has caused a lot of issues of tenants not being home or not understanding who's there. And that's something that was really important to us, especially that that notice be in the preferred language of the tenant. We also don't want to have that notice contain any language that permits landlords to decline inspections, which is a problem that we've seen in the city of L.A. Uh, and the last thing is that while most properties could wait once every four years, we would like any property that has a record of consistent code violations to have an increased inspection rate every two years. So that was routine inspections. There's also emergency inspections. So if you had an emergency complaint, then that would trigger an inspection within 24 hours of receipt of that complaint. Um, the main proposal and uh, feedback we had on this was just that we want more feedback on or we want more understanding of which emergencies trigger that 24-hour turnaround. Um, but we really appreciate that an emergency complaint does warrant that much quicker turnaround. Um, a non-emergency complaint can still trigger an inspection within seven days. So cutting it down to that week, um, ideally it's sooner than that. Obviously, still really excited that that's faster than the 21 days or three weeks that we saw before. So a re-inspection is what would occur if an inspector finds one or more violations during their initial inspection. So if the inspector does find violations, we they'll issue an official inspection report. It will cite all the violations that they find and also provide dates to correct the identified violations. And so that as proposed is 24 hours if it's an emergency violation and 21 days to correct a non-emergency violation. So again, as Chelsea mentioned, one issue that we're seeing currently is that these violations are noted and not actually fixed. One thing that we'd like to see is that a fine is levied for each uncorrected violation during the reinspection. So if 21 days later, the uh, inspector comes back and anything is not fixed yet, there's a fine levied for that. If even further inspections reveal that violations are still unresolved. So if they come back 21 days later, something still hasn't been resolved. They're going to come back in another 21 days. Now it's been almost six weeks. If the violation still isn't resolved, we'd like to see an, a higher fine imposed. We want to see a gradient in increasing amount of fines imposed that would increase with each delay. We also wanted to give the feedback that we don't want extensions to be granted, um, as you've already seen with the case that Chelsea brought up and that we'll see with our tenant panel as well. That is another way that we see landlords getting around actually making these um, fixes. So administrative review is the next step. So there is the initial routine inspection or emergency inspection. There's a re-inspection if needed. And then there is an administrative review if needed. So what was proposed here is that if a property remains out of compliance, then the county will issue a notice for administrative review within 30 days of the date. Um, anyone is allowed to present evidence, oral, like photos, videos, like for example, all those photos of Lourdes' apartment could be presented at a case like this. Um, the proceedings will be recorded and then a decision will be issued within 10 business days. It's great to see that this will be such an open process and that people will really be able to participate, um, including interested persons, which means that organizers can also come in if they're working with tenants closely on an issue. One thing that we had for feedback with this administrative review process was just that we wanted to see really clear guidelines and next steps on if the 
what the decision means and if a building is qualified for REAP, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. Um, we really would like to see those processes be super fair for tenants, uh, really clear and allow tenants to fully understand what might happen um, and why. If there's an appeal, uh, if the landlord wants to appeal their decision, um, then they may do so. And the appeals board has to issue a written decision within 15 calendar days. And they have to talk about their reasonings. Um, we just want to make sure that tenants are also permitted to request appeals if they feel the wrong decision was made. This is actually from the proposal slides. Um, and they have them posted online as well if anybody wants to look at them. And again, feel free to ask us. But um, these are the current program versus the proposed program. And this is for one to four units. Like I saw someone ask about single family homes earlier. So this is including single family homes. And this is for five plus units, which as Chelsea mentioned is the more frequently uh, inspected right now. And again, sorry, I'm gonna skip over this fast, but next page. So um, REAP that I mentioned earlier is the acronym that is used for the Rent Escrow Account Program. So a building enters into REAP if the time for compliance has expired. It means that you can pay rent into a specific account and it's what they do when violations are affecting health and safety, which we have already seen. There are some buildings that need to be in REAP that are not. The biggest commentary here is that we would really like to see tenants receive rent reductions up to 100% and that rent reductions shouldn't replace existing uh, RSO allowances. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we want really transparent and consistent guidelines to ensure that equitable treatment of tenants. So in REAP, uh, the process is that instead of paying your rent to your landlord, you would pay your rent into the rent escrow program. So then there would be a rent escrow account specific to your building. And those funds can only be used for three things that are listed here, which is really important in making sure that funds are actually going to repair the building and not just going to your landlord's profit. So that's expenses for preventing service or to repair services in your building. That's uh, correcting deficiencies. And that can either be the landlord correcting them or you as the tenant correcting them. And then finally, those funds can even be used to assist with relocation, which is either court ordered or can be from the uninhabitable conditions in the unit. So for example, Lourdes living with pests and without hot water, that could cover a relocation for her while those are being fixed for her and her family. Um, one comment we had here is just that we'd love to also see the county make it easier for tenants to access funds to repair instead of getting reversed, reimbursed. So instead of having to pay out of pocket and then ask for your money back, you'd be able to pay from a fund that they provide for you. Um, additionally, we'd love to see either a list of qualified contractors that could help you or providing workshops uh, or technical assistance so you could do those repairs yourself. So program fees, um, RHHP still had that the per the proposal is that the per unit fee is still to be determined, um, but the goal is that the registration fees will cover those annual program costs and that they're allowed to pass through 50% of those costs to their tenants. And then there's an additional fee if a unit's entered into a REAP. Our commentary is that we would like costs not to be passed on through the tenants. This should be a, a cost that the landlord is accounting for, uh, is caring for the safe home that they're supposed to be providing. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we'd like to see fines imposed and collected at every stage of the process rather than just as a final option. Again, that was my very quick over of the RHHP uh, and I'll pass it back to Maria. Wow, so much great information um, and stories and insight.
quick change. We did want to give you guys a break to digest. Um, however, in the interest of time and making sure that we don't go over today, um, we're going to get into our tenant panel, which is personally uh, the part that I was most excited for um, because we get to hear from our community members. Um, so I'm gonna get us started today. I'm going to introduce some of the tenants that we have with us today. Um, and we can get started with Demetria Scott. Uh, she is a SAGE member. She has been with uh, SAGE for a little bit now. Um, and Demetria, do you want to introduce yourself first? Hi, so, my name. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, Mary. sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, just your name and um, what brought you to our panel today. Hi, my name is Demetria Scott. I'm a tenant and a tenant advocate. And what brought me to the panel today is um, that I participate with the Healthy Housing Steering Committee. And I have similar issues uh, such as um, Lourdes. Thank you. Thank you, Demetria. Um, I will go ahead and introduce our next uh, panelist, uh, Lourdes. Um, Lourdes, you have actually heard a little bit about earlier um, from Chelsea. Uh, Lourdes is also a SAGE member. She's been with us for a couple of years as well. Um, Lourdes, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what brought you to here today? Hi, my name is Lourdes Villegas, and I've been with SAGE for uh, almost three years or a little over three years. Uh, what brought me here? Um, the habitability issues I've had. I was fortunate enough to uh, be introduced uh, to SAGE after I was um, initially started as an illegal eviction. Uh, Channel 34 got me in contact with you guys. And I've been fortunate to be um, part of you guys and through your advocacy programs, uh, getting uh, support. Thank you for sharing, Lourdes. Um, we'll come back to you in a little bit, but we have one more panelist today. Um, this is Erika. Um, Erika is a monolingual Spanish speaker. So if you um, are a monolingual monolingual English speaker, just please be sure that you are connected to the interpretation um, so you can hear and understand Erika. Um, Erika, uh, if you can introduce yourself and tell us what brought you to our panel today. Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Erika Elias. Y lo que me trae este panel es que soy miembro de CPC y hace un año se incendió una parte de de donde yo vivo, entonces llevo luchando con eso que no me han podido arreglar ni reubicar ni nada, entonces ese es mi lo que me ha llevado y la fuerza que me ha dado el grupo de CPC de, de estar luchando por mi vivienda. Thank you Erica for sharing. Um, I'm gonna pass it back over to Demetria. Um, if you could tell us a little bit, kind of like Erika just did, um, what does your current living situation look like, Demetria? And what are some of the habitability issues you're facing? My current living situation, <clears throat> again, um, si similar to Lord, is just so people know that a lot of these stories are are common. And if we don't get connected with Sage, we have so many um, people that are may not be getting the help. So I uh, think you know, thank you for for Sage. Um, I have mold, I have broken windows, uh, peeling paint. Um, the, the mold, of course, may be tied to the, the cracked windows because they're wooden frame and they're dry rotted out. Um, no repairs have been done. We've heard um, the mention in the research of unresolved issues. Um, so basically, it started um, when I got a new landlord as well. Um, but it got worse during COVID. Um, and I I haven't um, got any repairs done, although there's been numerous notices of an, of uh, to enter for inspection, similar to Lourdes' situation. So a lot of these things are common. And I have several complaints to the public health department. And when you guys talked about it earlier, it prompted me to... Um, I need to ensure to check to see if the 21 days has ran out or not. Um, 
because that's part of the process. I've done that process so many times over and over, but again, no repairs have been done. And the landlord has um, filed unlawful detainer um, during the COVID um, twice. Um, then most recently filed this year in April when the protections ended in March of this year. Um, and I initially had subsidized housing and something happened with that, which um, also led into um, the landlord filing another un unlawful detainer, which was dismissed by them in September, but then they refiled. So I actually have a court date coming up. I have a motion um, for summary um, for mandatory settlement conference um, on Tuesday, December 12th at the Stanley Mosque um, Court in Division 91. But I'm outraged and I've been stressed and um, it's caused a lot of different medical problems for me and my family, respiratory wise from the mold, but also stress wise, because how can landlords be allowed to evict or file unlawful detainers without dealing with the the um, the issues of habitability um, and which there's been retaliation and discrimination in that process as as well, because then there won't be any motivation to do to ever do the repairs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Demetria. And, you know, we will be in support with you on December 12th, but I want to pass it over to Lourdes. Um, I know we've already talked a little bit about your situation, but I want to ask you, you know, what does your current living situation look like? And I want to add in the question of how it, how has it impacted your health and the health of your family or your daily life? Hi. Uh Again, my name is Lourdes Villegas. Uh, my current living condition is uh, we have a lot of mold. It's uh, very difficult to breathe uh, in here. The stench is potent. Uh, I buy anything to make the change, the smell change. In the house, I buy these little pine trees that you place inside your cars and I hang them everywhere uh like ornaments in the window so that the air will blow the smell of the little pine trees um we don't have hot water uh with permits uh the landlord does not have permits for me to have hot water there is gas running through the wrong pipes uh my electricity he still has not obtained the permits for me to have electricity. Um, we still have roaches. We have um, lots of rats. Uh, we wake up and we have to dust off the rat poop from our pillowcases. Um, we have had Band-Aid repairs. Uh, the mold, uh, the landlord sent a handyman just to paint over it. This was less than two months ago. The mold is showing again. It has resurfaced. Um, this is just, you know, deplorable living conditions. How has this affected um, my children? Well, they wake up in the middle of the night pulling roaches off of their hair. Because we have long hair, so before we go to sleep, we have to braid our hair very, very tight to our skin so that the roaches won't be able to go through our hair. Um, sometimes if there is a roach that crawls on us, we slap it. And then, you know, all that stuff that comes from the roach, we have to wake up and go to the restroom, wipe ourselves off. Um, it's just disgusting to wake up in the middle of rot, uh, rat poop because it's on the bed. It's uh, chronic stress. Chronic stress. Uh, instead of waking up and fixing a breakfast for my children, I have to clean the stove because there's rat poop there as well. It's very, very stressful situation. Thank you. Thank you, Lourdes, for sharing. Um, Erika, I'm going to pass it back to you. I know you shared a little bit about your situation, but I want to ask you the same question. Um, how has your living situation and the habitability issues impacted your health and the health of your family? 
and your daily life? Mi situación me ha afectado en salud psicológicamente. Es estresante. Te daña tu salud. Um, llevo un año, no luz, no gas. Es estresante para, para mis niños. Se me, ahora he mirado que este año de para acá se me enferman muy fácil. Se enferman de gripe, de cualquier, cualquier virus. Es, es bien difícil la situación. Um, vivo Oscar, con constante puedo, estrés. Perdón, la voy a interrumpir un momentito porque no se está escuchando la interpretación. En... Ok, it's back. Ok, muy bien. Perdón, Erika, ya está sirviendo. Ok, continúa. No, no luz, no gas. Uh, siento que este año mis hijos se han enfermado mucho de virus. Been... Ellos son fuertes. Siento que eso me ha ayudado a no enfermarme. Sí, sí, psicológicamente sí me siento um, mal de salud. Pero por ellos trato de no, de no sentirme mal. Es sí ha cambiado mucho y sí ha habido mucha gente que se ha acercado a mí eso me ha ayudado a, a no caer porque el, el diario vivir de nosotros es dónde nos vamos a ir a bañar dónde se van a ir a bañar mis niños dónde vamos a calentar una comida a veces la comida se nos pudre porque ya hay humedad the food goes bad because um, there is a lot of humidity o sea es un desgaste bien duro, que no, 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 no hay cómo expresarme. Thank you, Erika. Um, Erika, I want to ask you one more question. Um, how do you think that the Department of Public Health has supported you in getting repairs? Have you made complaints? No. Apenas hace, desde hace un año que llegaron, apenas hace ocho días llegó, y con lo mismo que no sabe qué hacer. Wow. Thank you, Erika. Okay. Demetria, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, have you made any complaints to the Department of Public Health? Uh, of Public Health, and do you feel supported by them? I have made several um, complaints to the Department of Health. I don't feel supported by them. I don't like the fact that um, even in the past when they did ev eventually come out, um, if you try to clean up the mold or pay someone yourself to clean up, if they don't visibly see it, um, they won't make a report of it. Um, and they don't give mold tests, which is something they should do as well. Um, And again, it's not enforced. So they come out and they send out whatever letter to the landlord. And again, nothing is is resolved um, in in regards to um, to that. Um, and the other issue is um, knowing where to start. Because again, had not I been in contact with Sage, I didn't know exactly where to go. They'll tell you call two one one, but then you may be on the phone two or three hours. Um, before you get the chance to get a referral, because I did get a chance to get a referral also from 211 for public health, but it it took a long time and diligence. So depending on if you have phone or data on your phone or access to a phone. So again, having limited access sometimes causes more problems as well. Um, again, I've, I've had several notices to enter for inspections, which I've lost um, employment at one point as well, because I was missing too many hours to keep coming. And that was my fear as as well, um, losing wages. And then also with the evictions at the same time, um, being displaced and, and very, you know, feeling helpless. Like, what am I going to do? What am, what am my, my daughter and my granddaughter going to do? My granddaughter, he keeps a lot of um, upper respiratory infections as well. Um, but again, to answer your question, I haven't got any support with 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 the, all these things from the public health department. Thank you, Demetria. 
Lourdes, I'm going to um, ask you the same question. Um, have you made complaints with the Department of Public Health and have those complaints led to repairs? Do you feel supported at all? I made numerous complaints to the health department. Uh, no support. They just uh, don't know what to do with our case. Um, they pretty much, we were told that this is it. That's all they could do for us document um it is not in the will of the landlord to do the repairs it's just not in him he doesn't want to do them all they can do was um go ahead and refer our case to the district attorney we have never heard anything from the district attorney um we don't hear back from the health department all we know is that they said that this was that was all they could do document they cannot force him to do the repairs that is out of their hands that's not something they can do uh meanwhile it's been years upon years that we are here heating up water i am here heating up water um placing that hot water in a bucket day after day it's three of us in this house so i have to do it for both of my kids and myself to heat water because we don't have hot water and we didn't have carbon monoxide detectors till up until a couple of weeks ago. So just to make sure, because we have a, a gas leak, um, just to make sure that we're not going to be exposed to carbon monoxide, I have to heat up water for my children to take a shower. My 14-year-old, he is on a daily dose of, uh, he's asthmatic. He's on daily medication of steroids and he's having all these horrible side effects. He's having tachycardia. And after tachycardia, he has these withdrawals of the steroids and his sugar goes up. So my son is medicated every single day because of the mold exposure. And it's just multiplying. It's just growing more and more. But no help from the health department. I feel they are, they feel lost. They don't know from what avenue to help us anymore. So the best course of action was to just go ahead and transfer our case to the district attorney. But I haven't heard anything back from the district attorney at all. So this is where we stand. Thank you for sharing, Lourdes. I'm going to keep it on you for one second because you touched base on it a little bit. And I want to ask to see if you can um, come back to it. But... Uh, what has the communication with the Department of Health looked like um, from when you started making those um, those complaints? Um, how has the communication, how have they communicated with you? Has it been consistent? Has it been sporadic? What is your experience? Um, not consistent. Definitely not consistent. Um, they call if they call up. If they make a call, they call from a blocked number. They don't use a direct number where we can reach out to them. We don't, they definitely, the health department does not contact us through email, which would be the best way so we can keep an open communication. There's nothing in writing. They don't uh, send us any letters. Uh, they don't come and drop off notices at our door. It's just through phone and it is a blocked number. So... We don't know, did the health department call? We're just in the air. Was it the health department or was it a family member? We don't know. And they don't call from a direct line. Um, they don't give us a business card with a direct line. It's a general number. And trying to get that person or that agent that came to our door, it's almost impossible. It's, mm -hmm. But they don't uh, initiate a conversation through an email. And oftentimes I have asked, you know, because my child has multiple medical appointments, um, the best way to communicate with me would be through email, um, maybe a text message. I'm trying to get their phone number, a direct number. So I'm even, you know, throwing out in the air, maybe a text message. But no, they they don't give me nothing in writing at all. Thank you, Lourdes. Um, Erika, I'm going to come back to you. And for the interest of time, um, I want to 
make sure that we have time to get through some of the other questions. So Erika, I want to ask you, um, how long did you wait for your inspection? How long did it take the department after you made a complaint to come and inspect your unit? Para que llegaran a inspeccionar, tardaron como dos meses a tres meses. Y ahorita actualmente son expo... Desde hace un año no sabía nada de ellos, hace apenas hace ocho días. O sea, nunca se comunican para, para decirte si todavía estás bien. Nomás llegó el inspector a tomar fotos y le digo, ¿por qué tomas fotos? ¿Qué está pasando? Y no te hablan en el idioma que... En el que tú hablas solo inglés le dije no te estoy entendiendo lo que me estás diciendo o sea la verdad que decepcionada para nada apoyan a, a nadie y, y me duele ver el caso anteriormente que ella ha pasado más cosas difíciles que yo pensé que lo mío era difícil pero lo de ella no es duro entonces de verdad que sí necesitamos un cambio que nos escuchen Thank you, Erika. Um, I think all of you here today are going through incredibly difficult situations. And I just want to thank you again for, you know, taking the time. Um, Demetria, I'm going to come back to you. Um, and I want to ask you a different question. Um, but when you first started having these habitability issues, did you know which department to file complaints with? I did not. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, not knowing um, who to contact or what to do. Um, and usually you're just told to call 211. But even, as I mentioned, you have to wait for long periods of time, two to three hours, which your phone may hang up, may die. But also when you get someone on the phone, you're... They're understaffed as well. It's two and one, and they're covering a lot of area. And I, I believe I was told that many of those people are mostly like volunteers, so they're not really skilled to do the necessary research to connect you with the right referrals as well. So I've, it, it's been times that I was given referrals to the wrong agencies by two one one because they weren't aware themselves of the differences between what agencies cover unincorporated areas like Westmont or um, versus uh, the, the direct city of Los Angeles, all they hear. And it's for me, all I know, I'm in Los Angeles, but what does that mean uh, in regards to being in an unincorporated area versus um, the actual city of LA? And like that needs to be um, more um, understood. Um, so there needs to be more access and equity around even just knowing how to navigate um, and who to contact for habitability issues. Someone needs to be in charge or held accountable to make sure that the information is given to tenants. Like, for example, there shouldn't, if we're forced to sign a contract or um, something for housing, um, there needs to be some type of resources given to um, tenants to be able to understand and navigate through the repair process. And it needs to be, I heard someone mention earlier about some transparency. So there needs to be more transparency in how and who to contact for repairs, because I've been round and round in circles um, for about over a year before I realized who and what I'm supposed to speak with. And then um, another conversation in regards to like even having um, right to counsel on a lot of different issues because even learning that someone that handles evictions may not necessarily handle habitability. So also wasting time on things like that or having to contact multiple different attorneys or nonprofits in regards to multiple issues. I have complex multiple issues. As I hear, Lourdes has multiple issues and Erica has multiple issues, but sometimes one type of attorney can't handle all that or don't have the capacity so that also ties into needing legal um, need legal counsel. Thank you, Demetria. And we have about five minutes left, but we have one question and we really wanna try to end on a hopeful note. Um, so Lourdes, I wanna start with you um, in asking this final question, uh, but what do you envision the future of healthy housing to be and to look like? 
I uh, envision for the code enforcement to be more robust. Um, these inspections, the inspectors that are sent out here, that they do a thorough, absolute inspection that mold is removed through a mold inspector, um, a mold inspector and a mold professional specialist. Um, that a handyman does not take on electricity issues if he's not a specialist with electricity. And I hope no one ever again has to go through what I've gone through. It's been years. It's very hard. Uh, the day by day struggle. You feel helpless, hopeless. This is just a hate crime that these landlords get away with. So I hope that we get a more strong code enforcement. That's our hope for our community. Thank you for sharing, Lourdes. Erika, I'm going to pass it over to you for our final question. What do you envision the future of healthy housing to be and to look like? Que haya muchos cambios. Sé que no lo veo cerca, pero sé que la única que lo podemos hacer cambiar somos nosotros. Debemos de luchar uh, para que hayan leyes, este, para que las personas que estén sentadas ahí hagan valer nuestros derechos con, con los dueños, que hayan más régimen contra ellos porque ellos son los que están cometiendo el crimen contra nosotros entonces espero que nos unamos todos solo nosotros somos los que vamos a cambiar el sistema es de luchar y ese es mi es seguir luchando Thank you Erika for sharing and thank you again for being with us today uh, Dimitria, um, the final question, what do you envision the future of healthy housing to be and to look like? I envision, I agree with Erica and Lourdes, change in enforcement laws. Um, I believe that the timeline that the landlords are given, they're given too long of a timeline while we're um, suffering from medical conditions and poor habitability issues. So time is not on our side in those situations. So I envision a shorter um, code enforcement time frame. So for example, abatement within the faster time frame where the landlords are hitting their pockets a little faster. And as mentioned, that money goes into an account um, either for direct repairs or for um, funding to um, pay for relocation. I envision also at some point, um, especially with like a situation where Lourdes has had 22 inspections and nothing's been done at some point, um, like I know there's been some cases in New York with slum lords, they should be brought up on criminal charges for intentional and willful um, endangerment of, of families and children. So that's what I um, I envision as well as hiring certified mold remediation, rem remediators versus these handymen because any um, repairs that I have had, which has been minimum, they've been patchwork either by someone that the landlord has hired or someone that I can afford, which I then have to be careful with that because I don't want the landlord to say I'm damaging their property. So you, we want to make sure that people are certified. So that's what I envision that we're able to have healthy housing. And I envision that landlords cannot file unlawful detainers while there's habitability issues. Thank you. Thank you, Demetria, for sharing and the rest of our tenant panel for being with us today and being open to sharing your experiences. We really appreciate you all um, for being here with us today. Um, and that is going to be, we're going to be wrapping up our teaching today. Um, I'm going to see if we can share the presentation one more time um, so we can wrap up today. Um, so hearing from Demetria, Erica, and Lourdes, I hope that gives everyone a better insight into why we need to continue to fight 
for healthy housing and a more robust uh, code enforcement process and system in um, unincorporated LA County and in all of LA County in the whole state, right? Um, so if you are interested in joining us um, in learning more about how you can get involved, um, please feel free to write down my phone number. It's right here. My name is Mariana. Um, you are also welcome to email me. Um, we have a healthy housing committee here at SAGE that focuses on this work. Um, if we can go one more slide. Um, we have our healthy housing committee. The next one is Wednesday, January 17th um, at 530. We do these every third Wednesday of the month. Um, so if you are interested, please feel free to give me a call, text me, email me, and I can be sure to send over the Zoom link. Um, but before y'all go, I just want to thank you all so much for being with us today and taking some time to learn about code enforcement and hear from your community members about why this is important. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, uh, speak them out. Um, I'll be here for a couple minutes if anyone wants to share anything or has a, a lingering question. Um, but otherwise, thank you all so much for being with us. And I hope everyone has a great night.